We're going to spend this evening, the next two and a half hours, on William Butler Yeats and his poetry. Now, from our introduction last week, you well understand that his poetry is tied, of course, to Irish politics, to Irish traditions, and to his own personal autobiography. So much of what he writes explicates and fulfills his own thoughts and his own emotions about events that are occurring to him in government, in religion, in economics. He complains that he wasn't paid enough for his first plays. In art, his ties with William Morris and the Morris movement science, education. He doesn't like the theories of John Locke and opposes them. And of course, his own love for Maud Gunn and his companionship with his fellows. You read this in the poetry, but one place to find it contained and discussed intimately is in his autobiography. And I'd like to spend the first few moments of this session talking about Yeats's autobiography, his youth at Hammersmith, a school built around 1860 or 1870. Yeats was in school primarily in England, where he often found himself fighting with other students, and he found himself against uh, faced with very strong prejudices against the Irish. Remember, Yeats is Protestant Irish. He's tied to the idea of the United Kingdom. He's not amongst the Catholics. In fact, it was very uh, late in his teenage years that he first met a Roman Catholic because he lived in these uh, insular Protestant communities that have been set up over hundreds of years by the British and which primarily constitute the northern counties today. But he was Irish, and when he came down to England, he met with prejudice. I'd like to read you some of the passages from the autobiography, because he speaks well himself, and we'll let him talk. He says, I had never known companionship and enmity. He was a loner. After my first day's le lesson... A circle of boys got around me in a playing field and asked me questions. Who's your father? What does he do? How much money has he? Presently, a boy said something insulting. I had never struck anybody or been struck, and now all in a minute, without any intentions upon my side, but as if I had been a doll moved by a string, I was hitting at the boys within reach and being hit. After that, I was called names for being Irish and had many fights and never for years got the better in any one of them, for I was delicate and had no muscles. Sometimes, however, I found means of retaliation, even of aggression. There was a big boy with a big stride much feared by the little boys. And finding him alone in the playing field, I went up to him and said, Rise upon Sogan and sink upon God. What does that mean, he said. Rise upon Hayleg and sink upon straw, I said. And I told him that in Ireland, the sergeant tied straw 
and hay to the ankles of a stupid recruit to show him the difference between his left leg and his right leg. He said, my ears were boxed, and when I complained to my friends, they said I brought it upon myself. So he wasn't too smart on occasion. He got in a lot of fights. He did face the prejudice that he found, even though he was Protestant, and even though he felt himself part of United England, he came from Ireland, and that was enough to degrade him. He tells us more about his life. He says, I was afraid of the other boys, and that made me doubt myself for the first time. He had had the support at home. He was a writer. He wrote pretty well. And yet here he was, unable to face up to the others. I was afraid of physical pain. And one day, when I made some noise in class, my friend, an athlete, was accused of this noise, and I allowed him to get two strokes of the cane before I gave myself up. So he wouldn't confess until he saw his buddy being beaten, and then he figured he, he, he ought to say, he ought to be honest. He had held up his hands without flinching. Apparently he had been wrapped on the hands with a ruler, and he hadn't even rubbed them on his sides afterwards to show he had been hurt. The teacher knew, however, that I could not endure that. I was not caned, was, but was made to stand up for the rest of the lesson. Well, you get some of the emotional thoughts, or the thoughts of the emotions of a teenage youngster in school under these circumstances. He does tell us in his autobiography that when he went swimming with the other boys, he accidentally fell off a high perch and into the water, and they thought he had dived into the water. And they, they were amazed because they were afraid to do it. So since he had done it once, he continued to do it, and he won the admiration of his fellows by continuing to dive into the water uh, fearlessly. He tells us that he learned a lot from his father. His father used to read out poetry. For the first time, when I was eight or nine years old, he goes back in memory. Between Sligo and Ross's Point, this was in Ireland, he speaks about this, uh, this home of his. Between Sligo and Ross's Point, there is a tongue of land covered with coarse grass that runs out into the sea or the mud, according to the state of tide. It is the place where dead horses are buried. Sitting there, my father read me the lays of ancient Rome. It was the first poetry that had moved me. Later on, he read me Ivanhoe and the lay of the last minstrel, and they are still vivid in memory. I reread Ivanhoe the other day, but it has all vanished except the peasant girth. He said, Scott's the lay of the last minstrel gave me a wish to turn magician that competed for years with a dream of being killed upon the seashore. He tells us how he used to write. At 15, he went to art school. He gives us some good details of those circumstances. He talks about what the role of the artist is on page in his autobiography. He says it took him a while to realize that an artist's role is a lonely role. That you can't, if you want to mix with the masses, if you want to go to parties, if you want to be a celebrity, if you want to play out your latest works, it's one thing. But he said he realized that he got nothing done. And that if you're going to accomplish something, you're going to be by yourself, and you're going to be doing it alone. He says in this autobiography, It was many years before I understood that I had surrendered myself to the cheap temptation of the artist. Creation without toil. <laughs> Metrical composition is always very difficult to me. Nothing is done upon the first day. Not one rhyme 
is in its place. And when at last the rhymes begin to come. The first rough draft of a six-line stanza takes the whole day. A six-line stanza takes the whole day. He says, at that time I had not formed a style. And sometimes a six-line stanza would take several days and not seem finished even then. And I had not learnt as I have now to put it all out of my head before at night. And so the last night was generally sleepless. And the last day, a day of nervous strain. But now I had found the happiness that Shelley found when he tied a pamphlet to a fire balloon. That's a story we won't get into. But here we understand a writer learning how to write. And if you sit down to write a poem, you're frustrated because it doesn't work out right, or you've spent a day writing 30 lines, which is a lot, and then you've got to keep going over it and over it and over it. Listen to what Yeats, te Yeats tells you. It's a lot of adv good advice. He also describes in his autobiography some of the people he has met, particularly Uncle George Pollexfen, Mary Battle, the servant who had second sight and felt that she should, she could see visions of the dead, and Ma McGregor Matthews, who was known for copying occult manuscripts in the British Museum and who describes a visit from a ghost. Well, I'd like to spend a few moments reading his description of his uncle. Because he likes this man, but he doesn't like him. He's friends with him, but he's not friends with him. He gives us a balanced portrait, and in that we get our, a magnificent a thought, a description of a human being. I'm going to spend a few moments reading this, so you get some idea of how a writer describes intimately his own family. Most people who write about their family are circumspect. They will not point out faults. They will not get into intimate detail. They will not show the warts as well as the abilities. In fact, most descriptions are pretty vague and meaningless. Let's see what Yeats says. I found a supporter at Sligo in my elderly uncle, a man of 53 or 54, with the habits of a much older man. He had never left the west of Ireland, except for a few days to London every year and a single fortnight's voyage in Spain on board a trading, a trading, scooter, uh, a trading schooner. And this was in his boyhood. He was in politics a unionist and Tory of the most obstinate kind. And he knew nothing of Irish literature or society. Remember, one of Yeats's purposes is to bring back the stories of Ireland, to recreate ancient heroes, to create plays and to establish a theater, to generate pride in Irish culture. He was, however, strangely beset by the romance of Ireland as he discovered it among the people who served him, sailing upon his ships or attending to his horses. And though narrow and obstinate of opinion and puritanical in his judgment of life, he was perhaps the most tolerant man I've ever known. He never, how about this, listen, listen, listen to the way he describes this old guy. He never expected anybody to agree with him. And if you did not upset his habits by cheating him over a horse or by offending his taste, he would think as well of you as he did of other men. And that was not very well. He didn't like anybody. And he would, however, help you out of any scrape you were in. I was accustomed to people much better read than he, much more liberal minded, but they had no life but the intellectual life. And if they and I differed, they could not take it lightly and were often angry. And so for years now I had gone to Sligo, sometimes because I could not afford my Dublin lodging, but most often for freedom and peace and he would receive me. 
when Parnell was contesting an election at Sligo a little before his death. Other Unionist magistrates refused to make, refused or made difficulties when asked for assistance. There were problems in this election. And so my uncle gave that assistance. He walked up and down some town hall assembly room or some cart room with Parnell, but would tell me nothing of that, except that Parnell spoke of Gladstone with extravagant hatred. Well, this is the diary. This is the autobiography of William Butler Yeats. And I think anyone who wants to study what he has done and what he has said what he feels ought to go to that source. He tells us, he tells us in that diary about the occult. He says, I once heard Sir William Crooks tell half a dozen people that he had seen a flower carried in broad daylight slowly across the room by what seemed an invisible hand. His chemical research led to the discovery of radiant matter. But the science that shapes opinion has ignored his other research. The new science, the political science, the economic science, the physical science, says Yeats. Science has driven out the legends, stories, superstitions that protected the immature and the ignorant with symbols. And now that the flower has crossed our rooms, science must take their place and demonstrate as philosophy as in all ages that states are justified, not by multiplying it as it would seem, comforting those that are inherently miserable, but because sustained by those for whom the hour seems awful and by those born out the best and those born out of themselves the best born of the best. What he's saying is science isn't going to explain everything. Science must give way to the occult. Science must give way to these visions that people have and then we must discover what it is that helps us understand life. Among the experiences we know that are told in this autobiography are the people that uh, Yeats has met. He tells us about the Rhymers Club that he formed in Ireland. He talks about the Irish Literary Society. He tells us about the people who joined him at the Cheshire Cheese Restaurant in London. Lionel Johnson, Ernest Dalson, John O'Leary, Standish O'Grady, the author of the History of Ireland. These are the people whose names are speckled through the autobiography and give us a sense of what he was. We will find out that he joined the socialist cause, but soon abandoned it because he wasn't interested in this political motivation. Furthermore, he wasn't interested in anything that took away from Irish nationalism. He didn't like the motivation of people who let the end justify the means. And he says it was time for him to move away from propaganda and go back to writing. Now I'd like to turn to one of the sets of the poems that... Uh, he gave us first. This was a collection of poems called The Rose, and you find it on page six of your text. The first poem is To the Rose Upon the Road of Time. Now, road is a cross. We, and Mr. Jafaris, who, who has given us a good criticism of uh, Yeats, tells us that the rose grew in complexity in Yeats's work. The rose becomes actually a symbol of Ireland. And a human being, Rosendub, Dark Rosalind, she was called, was the personification of Ireland. 
The rose appears in religious poetry. The rose is the spiritual, is the symbol of spiritual and eternal beauty. The rose is also a Rosicrucian symbol, and Yeats was influenced by people who believed in the Rosicrucian symbolism, which was a symbolism that grew up in the 17th century, developed in the 17th century. Those of you who have read Alexander Pope's Rape of the Lock and have seen the images of the sylphs and the gnomes understand that these were taken from Rosicrucian symbolism. Uh, the Rosicrucian symbolism gives us four leaves of a rose with a crucifix imp imposed upon it. In Paris in 1888, there was the Kabbalistic order of the rosy cross, Kabbalistic order of the rosy cross, so that the rose was in Kabbalism, which of course was that medieval mystic thought that came to Yeats, came to Yeats through Paracelsus, through Bam, through Blake, and through others. We talked about that. Yeats studied mystic tradition, and it began in 1887 when he was 22 years old. Uh, those of you who are ready to go on to your master's thesis may want to come across some topic equally enchanting to give you the types of thesis that you will write or to give you the basis of poetry you're going to handle. Let's look at the poem, First the Rose, on page six. He says, Red Rose, Proud Rose, Sad rose of all my days. For Yeats, the rose was not necessarily a symbol of beauty. It was a symbol of what embraced the problems you had. The rose could suffer a worm inside. The rose could suffer faded petals. The rose could wilt. It's not just a rose that suddenly blossoms and is beautiful. It's an Irish rose. And the Irish rose always has a degree of pessimism attached to it. Red rose, proud rose, sad rose of all my days. Come near me while I sing the ancient ways. Kekulin, battling with the bitter tide. The druid, gray, wood-nurtured, quiet-eyed. Who cast round Fergus dreams and ruin untold. And of course, here are some of the themes that you find in this poem, uh, To the Rose Upon the Root of Time. Uh, Yeats probably got it from Samuel Ferguson, who had collected these myths. And of course, the name of Kekulin appears, the hero of the Red Branch Cycle, whom we dealt with last week in The Death of Kekulin, the hero who kills his own son. Some of the themes came from myths and folklore in Ireland. Fergus was the son of Roy, and Fergus marries Ness. Fergus is the king. Before his love for Ness, he gives up, up his throne to Conchabar, king of Ulster. Turn to the poem, The Rose of the World. This is a love poem, but it recognizes, by implication, Usna. Now, Deirdre, who is the daughter of King Conchabar's storyteller, prophesied that Usna would bring havoc upon the Irish kingdom. Conchabar wanted her to be reared to be his future king, or er, his future queen, but uh, Usna falls in love with Naos instead, a red branch hero. And they escape to Scotland. Conchabar offers peace if Fergus will return. But when Conchabar, uh, when Usna returns, Conchabar has her sons beheaded. Derdra the poetess laments the death of Usna's children. And then we have the curse upon Conchabar, a 
a story that goes on to tell us that Deirdre ultimately kills herself. And there are various versions, one by stabbing herself, the other by leaping from a chariot. And so let's read this poem, The Rose of the World, knowing that it deals with the death of Uzna's children. Who dreamed that beauty passes like a dream? For these red lips, with all their mournful pride, mournful that no new wonder may be tied, Troy passed away in one high funeral gleam, and Usna's children died. Incidentally, look at the rhyme. Pride rhymes with died. That's a motif of the poem. Either you will be a victim of pride or your family will be a victim of pride. So the rhyme is not accidental. It's not unintentional. It's carefully chosen. And when we get to some of Yeats's later poems, you'll be amazed to see how complex these rhymes become and how many of them he provides. The next stanza. We and the laboring world are passing by. Life doesn't stand still. What's going, God, what is going to be your purpose and your mission? Amid men's souls that waver and give place like the pale waters in their wintry race, under the passing stars, foam of the sky, lives on this lonely face. Uns Usna, her lonely face. Agamemnon, his lonely face. They become part and parcel of history. Bow down, archangels, in your dim abode. Before you were or any hearts to beat Weary and kind, one lingered by his seat. He made the world to be a grassy road before her wandering feet. Someone plotted this world. Someone gave judgment to Usna. Someone gave her this road to tragedy that she was poor forced to pursue. And let me tell you, that's a much different road being pursued than one of successors who gain power and fame. But it may not be a much different road than the road that Bunyan tells us about in Pilgrim's Progress, where Christian, on the road to the celestial gates, and the holy city must fight his way through the slow of despond and the castle of despair in order to reach the goal he reaches. So this is a religious poem. And it's a poem of some moment. Let's look at another poem. Remember that Fergus alienated Conchabar. There are two poems I'd like to look at, pages 14 and 15. One is, When You Are Old. Now, he's asking people to read this book. He's a poet. He's written it. We know the themes he has in it. And we know that they apply to Ireland and they apply to the conflicts in Irish society. When you are old and gray and full of sleep, the first stanza says, who are you reading this book? The second stanza says, what have you done in your lifetime? And the third stanza says, you must reconcile yourself to the life you have read. This way. 
when you were old and gray and full of sleep and nodding by the fire. Take down this book and slowly read and dream of the soft look your eyes had once and of their shadows deep. But who were you? How many loved your moments of glad grace and loved your beauty with love, false or true? But one man loved the pilgrim soul in you and loved the sorrows of your changing face, your lover. That's over with. And bending down beside the glowing bars, murmur, that is the, 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 the fire on the, on the grate of the stove. And bending down beside the glowing bars, murmur a little sadly, how love fled and paced upon the mountains overhead and hid his face amid a crowd of stars. That's where the memories are in the stars. The star imagery that you find in the Irish poetry, we assume comes from Persian literature and from Persian folklore or from Eastern folklore because the stars carry the faces and carry the bodies and carry the human beings that they uh, leave this earth. Who goes with Fergus? And this, of course, is who is with your hero. Who will go drive with Fergus now and pierce the deep woods woven shade and dance upon the level shore, knowing that this man is going to lead you into enmity with your leader. Will you join him? He says, For Fergus rules the brazen cars and rules the shadows of the wood and the white breast of the dim sea and the disheveled wandering stars. Again, stars have a certain Kabbalistic imagery, a certain occult signification, and uh, we don't have to go very far in the 20th century to know how important the stars are to people who read their astrology every day. We're going to now move into another phase of our discussion tonight. Mr. Talk is going to introduce you to another set of Yeats's poetry, and that's the poetry identified as the Green Helmet, and other poems. Good. Good evening. Oh, excuse me. Good evening. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Is that okay? I assume it is. The title of this work that we will be studying on is The Green Helmet and Other Poems by William Butler Yeats. Uh, this can be found in your book, pages between 31 and 37. Uh, part that I will specifically talk on is a woman Homer sung, words, no second Troy, the fascination of what's difficult, and a drinking song. And that will be what I would cover. William Butler Yeats was born in 1865, perhaps significantly, perhaps not, but this was the last year of the American Civil War, an uh, event which I'm sure the Irish should wish they could have had and had over with several hundred years ago, an event which has not happened and still continues. Um, Yeats himself was an Irish Protestant, as we know. He was born to a father who was highly articulate, his father was an artist. Uh, his father was actually educated for law, but became an artist uh, in search of intellectual pursuits and self-development. And this actually influenced Yeats himself greatly. It was something that he uh, enjoyed, listening to poetry from his father, reading and studying. But unlike his father, who was more of a painter than an artist, 
he himself was more interested in writing and the intellectual pursuits, uh, his own self-introspection, if you will. His mother, on the other hand, was a very religious and almost common woman, I would say. Uh, she was not comfortable with intellectualism. She was not comfortable with the arts. And she was more from the country, if you will, in the county of Sligo. This is where he spent a lot of his time as a boy, when they would go into Sligo and would be talking to his mother. They actually got more of an education toward what the common folk of Ireland had, what they, their traditions, their past, and what they understood. From this, Gates would go on to draw his own ideas of individual growth and thoughtful and poetic expression. As we know, his poetry took him a long time to write, something he really thought about. Um, if you read these poems, you can really take your time and get a lot out of each one of them, um, but you really have to read it several, several times to get all the possible meanings that are in there. Uh, there is so much that is in there. Uh, Yeats himself was born shortly after the potato famine. It's one of the historical events that occurred at that time. Potato famine killed, literally starved to death, over a million people. If such a thing were to happen today, it would be a great tragedy. Of course, there are great numbers of murders and starvations that do occur, even today, throughout the world. It is a great tragedy. But certainly this played a part upon the Irish psyche. One and a half million Irish people, both men and women, immigrated to the U.S., overseas, other countries, basically to get away from the starvation and the prejudice. The English did nothing to stop this, nothing whatsoever. And that is a, indeed the great tragedy. It's almost, to me, the Irish have suffered a great deal, um, done a lot of research on that. This problem, if you will, between the English and the Irish has gone on for many, many centuries. Still goes on today. Um, the Irish typically, even the Irish Protestants, as we heard earlier from Dr. Rothman, the Irish Protestants themselves suffer prejudice from the English, even though they are most loyal, the Unionists, if you will. Uh, they are not the Republicans, which is, in America, I guess the more conservative party, but over in Ireland, uh, being a Republican is something else entirely. Uh, being more equivalent to, I guess, being a little bit more radical, but perhaps not. Just depends upon your point of view. The most important Irish head of state during this time was, of course, Charles Parnell an Irish leader who fought basically for Irish independence. He wanted Ireland for the Irish. Um, he was, as we've learned previously, driven out of office due to scandal, uh, wherein he was caught in an affair with Mrs. O'Shea, whom he later married after her divorce. Uh, perhaps one of the most, uh, excuse me, most poli important political event close to the writing of these poems, and these poems were written around 1910, so it's important to understand that Yeats by this time was in middle age. He was not the young writer anymore. Okay? He was in his 40s, about 45 when this was published. So he's not exactly the youthful boy anymore. But one of the, like I said, one of the most important political events was the formation of the Irish Republican Brotherhood and the Irish Republican Brotherhood was basically an active or active arm to t carry out anti-English or anti-British actions. Um, this group might be more equivalent nowadays to the Irish Republican Army, although there can't be said to be any direct descendancy other than through their political means.
Okay. Importantly, to Yates at least, one of the people in his life that mattered the most, Maud Gawain, who was an actress and who was very much not a shrinking violet, was involved with the IRB. She was involved in ways of actually in putting the Irish Republican Brotherhood in touch with French intelligence during the wars. Uh, she was also involved with giving the Boers, who were from Dutch South Africa, uh, plans on how to put a bomb on board ships for British troops headed down to South Africa. So she by no means would we say is a woman that was a shrinking violet. She was very headstrong. Yates was very, very deeply affected by her, very, very much in love with her. Um, another pro important political event during this time was the formation of Sinn Féin. Sinn Féin uh, was formed to establish political goals, basically to maintain the culture and traditions of the Irish. And in Gaelic, this loosely translates as we ourselves. Uh, we ourselves, this is symbolic of the Irish struggle, because we ourselves um, represents those that the Irish wish to rule, which is they themselves, and those to whom they must look to have their own independence, they themselves. Excuse me, I've got a little bit of a cold tonight. Um, this later led to the Home Rule Movement. The Home Rule Movement occurred right around 1908, started then. Uh, the Home Rule Movement would later lead to the Easter Rebellion, and the Easter Rebellion was the formation of the real IRA, and the real IRA were slaughtered at that time by the English. Out of the 15 major revolt leaders, 15 were executed for their actions. Significant life events that were occurring to Yeats at the time of writing these poems uh, might be said to include the marriage of Maud Gawain. She was actually married. Uh, she had been his unrequited love for many, many years. This man chased her for a long time. Um, she had been most influential to him in his writing. While he pined for her affection, she sought to push him toward political action. She was a woman who actually wanted him to be involved in the Sinn Féin, to be involved in keeping the national traditions and goals of the Irish people, to be involved in using his writing for nationalist propaganda. Um, however, Yates being the man that he was, um, he was more interested in writing. He, really enjoyed writing romantic poetry, really enjoyed thinking about his writing. In his youthful days, he did do a bit of political writing, but by the time that this, these poems were actually written, he was writing more for Maud, or more for himself, if you will. you really read through this poem, I think that's going to ring clear. I mean, if you read and sit down and look at these, poet, these poems, you will see that he's basically praising her, uh, almost chastising her in a few instances, but then chastising himself for even thinking that way. Uh, he tends to look at this um, as, you know, he's suffered a great deal. He's been through misery. He's wanted to chase her down. He is wanted all these things. He's also enjoyed the pursuit of this unrequited love. It's not something that uh, take lightly. Um, you know, he may have lost her in the end, although strangely after right around the time that this was written, uh, she had a breakup in her marriage and as we know from last class, Yates proposed marriage to her again. He got rebuffed again. Um, 
and strangely, he proposed to her daughter. Uh, I don't know how that was expected to work, but uh, surprise, not surprisingly, she also rebuffed him. Um, one of the things, if you read through these, you'll see, especially one of the poems I did not get to, um, or will not get to, it says, to a poet who would have me praise certain bad poets, imitators of his and mine. One of the things that Yeats is talking about in several of these poems is his concern for the less educated poets. Uh, his concern that, you know, basically, I work so hard for this. I have mastered these words, and you are telling me to praise everyone. It's also a little bit of political innuendo going on here um, because basically the Sinn Féin, he felt, had a lot of semi-literary uh, societies. He didn't really believe that these people were so dedicated to their writing and as well educated. May have been, I guess, at its worst point, if you look at it, um, it could come across almost as snobbery, almost as the Protestant, I guess, uh, snobbish attitude toward the less, what they perceived as a less educated Catholic middle class, did not have the history of the classical education. Of course, the Catholics had not had also the advantages that the Irish Protestants had economically, educationally, socially, especially in the Northern Ireland provinces. Specific events in the works. Let's start first with the woman Homer sung. Um, this is actually a very excellent poem, indicative of his style. In the first stanza of this poem, Yeats is speaking of Maud Gone and her problems with being attractive. Another way of looking at this, he is also speaking of Ireland. Very roundabout way, Ireland was attractive to the British. The Irish people were not, but Ireland itself was. One of the reasons you have the Irish Protestant community. When he speaks of Maud gone shaking with hate and fear when each man approaches her uh, because he might hold her dear, um, he might also have been speaking of Ireland. Where you can see that if someone were to covet the land of Ireland, Ireland might be afraid of the powerful English. They also might hate them, resent them. But also, one of the things that really is, makes it a romantic poem, is that it is about Maud, in a way. Because she was very, very attractive. So, like I say, a high-strung woman, an actress, an activist, a thinker. And she made him, he was very desirous of her, let's, let's put it that way. Um, he is also reflecting upon this in the second stanza, or second part of the poem. He's talking about being old and being gray, middle life. He's lost his love. He's lost Maud. He's lost his chance. But he still, he looks back upon this and thinks, you know, I still have her reflection in my mind. I still have the memories of what have happened. I still have the memories of the chase, his unrequited love. One of the things that is really symbolic about this poem and is indicative of his style is basically his use of the classical mythology. He talks about Maud as having fiery blood, uh, being able to trod so sweetly proud as to wear upon a cloud. Um, a woman, Homer's song, the life and letters seem but an heroic dream. What he's talking about here, um, to me, is that Maud and Ireland, both full of passion, both formed from the elements, both very classical, um, classical in beauty, able to walk in the clouds, almost angelic. 
he is talking about. Um, this is indeed one of the more romantic poems in the group, and definitely one that I, I was really impressed with. Words, to me, the second poem. Again, Yeats is clearly reflecting upon his relationship with Maud, but also upon his relationship with his fellow human beings. This is an introspective poem, one where you're examining your own inventory, looking at your psyche, and he is doing that. He said, I had this thought a while ago, my darling cannot understand what I have done or what would do in this blind and bitter land. Well, if you're a poet, you're an introspective person, you realize people don't understand what you're trying to say. They may not quite get it right away. Um, and this is what he's doing. He says, I grew weary of the sun until my thoughts glowed up again, remembering that the best I have done was to, done to make it plain. So he's kind of talking about this. He's thinking, well, okay, they don't quite get what I'm doing, but I'm also myself and I'm un pursuing this intellect, pursuing my development, pursuing myself, and I'm trying to do this best to make it plain. But who is he trying to make it plain for? Is he making it plain for himself? Is he making it plain for his reader? Well, interestingly, most of this stuff came from his diary, which is a very good place if you like to write, you have a diary. Um, one of the reasons I guess it took him so long was that he did this for himself. Every year I cried at length, my darling understands it all, because I have come into my strength and words obey my call. He's speaking here of his mastery of writing. Um, his own, interestingly, if you're a master of writing, he also talks to himself because he's almost deceived himself in this part. Um, it's making himself believe that Maud would see the gains in his art and his skill as she would come to love and understand him. Well, it didn't happen. Um, wasn't destined to happen, as a matter of fact. Okay. The last part of this poem is quite interesting. That had she done so, who can say what would have shaken from the sieve? Or, excuse me, sieve. Uh, bad. Okay. I might have thrown poor words away and been content to live. Had she taken him up, had she taken him up on his constant nagging, going after her, pursuing her, he might have just content to throw all that he's gained away. That's what he's saying. The poor words is also a reference to some of the other writers that were of the, his time. Excuse me. And he was talking about that, and he just said, no, my art is something I've gained. I have learned from this. I have profited. It's kind of uh, a dual message here. You know, I would have loved her on the one hand, but on the other side, I have gained much. She's been my muse, and I can draw from this. Okay. No second Troy. This one is a clearly a classic. Um, clearly an allusion to mythology, um, or at least Greek mythology if we want. He is attributing to Maud Gaughan the beauty of Helen of Troy, along with some of her less than desirable qualities, if you'd like. Um, he's talking about, if we remember, Helen of Troy, Greek mythology, uh, was captured and then spent some time in an adulterous affair. Her husband gar uh, gathered an army, went to Troy, the famous Trojan horse, uh, where they burned and sacked the city of Troy, all for Helen. Um, Yeats himself, however, does not blame uh, Maud He's, when he says, Why should I blame her that she filled my days with misery, or that she would of late have taught to ignorant men most violent ways 
or hurled the little streets upon the great. Um, this is also somewhat of an allusion to the bombing plot that Maud was involved with. She did, however, withdraw from the IRB and withdraw from these activities later. Um, but he's also talking about how he has suffered in this pursuit of love, um, his unrequited love for Maud. One of the things he was also talking about here was the Sinn Féin again, the Literary Society. He talks about hurl the little streets upon the great. This one uh, is an allusion to the class consciousness again of the Irish Protestant Yates. He was dealing with the Catholics of the Sinn Féin Literary Societies. Um, she always wanted him, Maud that is, always wanted him to take more of a role in maintaining that tradition and culture. Um, Yeats disagreed with a lot of what the Sinn Féin movements had, um, which for an Irish hero and poet, uh, that's somewhat strange, but he was a nationalist in some senses, and then again he wasn't. So there are some perplexing things about him. Um, Okay. Yates himself also talks about Maud when he said, What could have made her peaceful with a mind that nobleness made simple as a fire with beauty like a titan bow? Um, this clearly is a sexual illusion. You know, he is talking about her, um, her effect on men is tightening them, tightening them up like a bow or perhaps her figure or perhaps that she is much like Cupid's instrument. She is much like the bow of Cupid. It strikes love into the hearts of men. Uh, the fact that she had a beauty that was not at natural in this age, again, is an allusion to Helen of Troy, and again is an allusion to saying that she was a classical beauty. Uh, she was someone for all the ages. He also uh, talks in circles, if you will, about her uh, involvement in the IRB. Um, so why, what could she have done being what she is? Was there another Troy for her to burn? Um, these were the radical bombing plans. This one was written in 1908, about the time that those plans were in, a, you know, for Maud were part of her life working with the Boers um, toward putting that bomb on the British troop ships. Okay. And he talks about his heart being at peace because neither Dave nor Dolt can break what's not for their applause being for a woman's sake. Um, so did she your strength renew a dream that a lion had dreamed till the wilderness cried aloud a secret between you two between the proud and the proud. Uh, certainly, Maud Gunn was a very proud woman. Uh, he's kind of admitting that he is a very proud man. Uh, in fact, he actually is, I would say, stating that. And his pride in chasing her left him basically alone when she got married. It was something he had to face. There's an air of finality in these poems. There's an air of you know, my love that I have chased for so long has left me for someone else, and I have not gotten what I wanted. It is, uh, I guess, the sadness of the unrequited love. The man who has chased has enjoyed the pursuit, and the woman who obviously didn't quite exactly say no for a long, long time, and who enjoyed the chase. Uh, but they were both so pri proud, if you will, that perhaps it was never destined to be. They were too much alike. 
Um, could be. One of the things that he is saying here also is that she renewed his strength. She was the reason for his writing. She drove him to write. He sought to explain to her and express his love through poetry, uh, express his desire for her in hope that she would reciprocate. One of the things he also admits in this poem is that he has um, himself felt anger, hurt, and the pain of the loss of love. He says, how what, how what her dreaming gave earned slander, ingratitude, from self-same dolt and knave. Well, that probably is himself. And he is probably admitting to her and the rest of the world that yes, he was angry about it and he was hurt. He says, I and worse wrong than these, yet she, singing upon her road, half lion, half child, is at peace. Uh, the innocence of a child, the pride of a lion. Kind of a strange mix, but uh, very heroic, or in this case, I guess, for a heroine. Um, something that we would all hope that she would be at peace with herself. Fascination of what's difficult. This one is a poem uh, from Yeats himself that is basically talking about his involvement in the National Theater. This time when he was writing in the National Theater, when he was producing his plays, the Irish National Theater, he became kind of a little tired and worn out in dealing with actors and dealing with all these things that were involved in putting on a play. Uh, you can read this quite clearly through here when he says, the fascination of what's difficult has dried the sap out of my veins, rent spontaneous joy and natural content out of my heart. So all his love and desire for writing and doing these things has really kind of just been pulled from him because he's so exhausted. He's like, ah, I've got to deal with all these people, you know, put on all these plays, do all these things. It's just tearing me apart. Uh, that something ails our cult. And here the cult is himself. Something ails our cult. Uh, that must, as if it had not holy blood, nor on Olympus leapt from cloud to cloud. Well, on Olympus, this is uh, a reference to Pegasus, the winged horse, which uh, is also a reference to Yeats, also a reference to the pursuit of art. about how he's actually feel like a plow horn.
that time, Oh, no. I lift the glass to my mouth, I look at you and sigh. Very short, very, very short, but very true. Um, when I first read this, I would have thought that this was myself. I actually would have thought that uh, I could have said this, anyone could have said this. Um, I would have thought that Yeats himself would have done this for himself to say. This one was actually produced for Lady Gregory, whom he had met many, many years before in the 1890s. It was part of involving him in the Irish literary circle at uh, Cool Park. And it was written for a play of hers. Miranda Lena is a barmaid who is actually flirting with this drinking song, giving this toast to a misogynist captain. Now, that's a really strange thing. But uh, saying I lift this glass, wine comes in the mouth, Love comes in at the eyes. It's all we know, f shall know for truth. Before we grow old and die, I lift the glass, I look at you and sigh. That is, uh, to me, a very true expression. And a very flirtatious expression uh, of romance. You express to tr the truth to yourself. Uh, sighing, almost in the knowledge of what is not to be. And this is something Yeats was also doing in the knowledge that he had lost while it gone. Style of these work, uh, these work came from his, these works, excuse me, came from his private diaries. Uh, they were later published in The Green Helmet and Other Poems in 1910. Prime narrator of the poems is Yeats himself. Stylizes this work as psych psychological self-examination. Uh, he accepts the finality of the loss of his love of Maud Gon. So again, as I said before, he would propose marriage to her again, and again when rebuffed, propose to her daughter. He also seems to be searching within himself for a justification for his years of fruitless chase of his goddess. Uh, he makes her his muse, the impetus behind his mastery of words and growth in his art. Uh, my favorite poem her favorite quote is actually the whole poem of a drinking song, which we've read. Uh, another favorite quote is the imagery that Yeats, or excuse me, Yeats uses to describe Maud Gon in a woman Homer sung, and that would be part, last part of that. Uh, For she had fiery blood when I was young, and trod so sweetly proud as twere upon a cloud. A woman, Homer sung, that life and letters seem but an heroic dream. Uh, in my mind and understanding, I'd say he is a most romantic author, uh, expresses the love of a man for a woman, although unrequited, in classical and elegant terms. Um, this mix of passion, it's reflection, mythology, heroic epic poetry gave him all the qualities of a classic poet were brought forth into a modern age. He places himself in the role of the intellectual hero opposite the impassioned figure of the powerful heroine, Maud. She is a driving force behind his art and at once the remover of his dreams. He cannot blame her for the, this loss, however, for she has given him a pursuit and a craft and led him to his destiny. 
while he may mourn this loss for her love, he may secure himself in the knowledge that he has gained far more from her inspiration. One of the things that Dr. Rothman had brought up earlier and I had passed um, was how difficult this was for him to write these poems. And one of the things he wrote about that in his diary was, Today, the thought came to me that Maud never really understands my plans or natures or ideas. Then came the thought, what matter? How much of the best I have done and still do is but the attempt to explain myself to her. If she understood, I should lack a reason for writing, and one can never have too many reasons for doing what is so laborious. Um, true, it's very true. Um, having a good reason to write, I think we can see that he was quite the romantic poet, that he really did love her, he really did love his people, um, and he really loved his craft. And I found him quite a stimulating author, and actually someone to enjoy and read. Thank you, Mr. Tuck. That was a, uh, a complete and detailed statement about the poems. The <coughs> capability to, I mean, your capability to review this material and your confidence in presenting it, of course, makes this whole project worthwhile and the course much more meaningful than if I alone were to be uh, discussing this literature. Yesterday I was driving by Main, on Main Street and turned right on Gray's Wood, and there in the bayou on the concrete embasement was a seagull. And suddenly the most magnificent thing was realizing that this animated bird, this beautiful white bird, was perched amongst all the concrete and amongst the restaurants and uh, near the post office and near the tawdry hotel, uh, uh, motels, was this unique and powerful symbol of life and beauty that just seemed far more impressive than anything around it. And I think that's what Yeats realized when he saw these swans at Cool, Lady Gregory's estate, and his selection of poems, The Wild Swans at Cool, uh, celebrates these swans. He came back 19 years after he had first seen them, and there they were still, this, this symbol of beauty. He says, I must have spent the summer of 1897 at Cool. Now he's back there again in 1916. He says, I was involved in a miserable love affair that had but for one brief interruption absorbed my thoughts for years past and for s some years since. In 1916, when he returned to Cool, he knew that Maud Gunn's husband, John McBride, had been shot in the 1916 uprising, and again, she was available. But here he is at Cool, at Lady Gregory's estate, and he looks at the swans, and Lady Gregory himself reminds, Lady Gregory herself reminds him of George Moore's views of the swans of Cool. George Moore, who had also been at Cool, at Lady Gregory's estate, said this, or wrote this description. Thirty-six swans rising out of a lake and floating round it and settling down in it is an unusual sight. It conveys a suggestion of fairyland, perhaps because thirty-six wild swans are so different from the silly china swan which sometimes floats and hisses in melancholy whiteness up and down a imitative stone basin. That is all we know of swans, all I knew, until the 36 rose out of the hushed lake at our feet and prompted me, says Lady Gregory, to turn to Yeats, saying, you're writing your poem in its natural atmosphere. So let's look briefly at the wild swans at Cool, 
on page 51. This is Yeats describing what I cannot describe of that seagull I saw in Brazewood Bayou. The trees are in their autumn beauty. The woodland paths are dry. Under the October twilight, the water mirrors a still sky. Upon the brimming water among the stones are nine and fifty swans. This moment he captures, this moment he encapsulates, this, this anguish he has with his own problems being mitigated by this image of beauty which transcends himself. The 19th autumn has come upon me since I first made my count. I saw before I had well finished all suddenly mount and scatter, wheeling in great broken rings upon their clamorous wings. I've looked upon those brilliant creatures, and now my heart is sore. What a difference between his feelings and these examples of beauty. Let's take a break. And when we come back, I'm going to discuss uh, the poem on the death of Lady Gregory's son. And then Mr. Dornbus will give some talks with two more speakers. Uh, are there any questions at the point? First of all, let's see, who is at Woodlands? That's Miss Fensel? Yes, I'm here. Is Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Are you there by yourself? Uh-huh. Yes. Oh. All yeah. right. Well, anytime you feel... By the way, we just found out tonight that you can broadcast your presentation from where you are. You don't have to come in. Oh, okay, good. That so, works out good. So we're going to let you broadcast from the woodlands. Um, I, I, and uh, you tell Mr. Uh, Strike. Strike that he can do that too. Oh. So you don't have to drive in now. Oh, great. I appreciate it. All right. Also, so, too, a representative from Student Services gave us a syllabus that you faxed over. Right. But it still does not have the outline for the presentation. Uh, right. When I talk to you okay, we'll put that in the mail to you today, uh, tomorrow. Okay. Right? Yeah, that's okay. right. I faxed it to them and I forgot to do that. Uh, okay. Last, last point. Miss Garcia there in the West Houston. I spoke to her on the phone last night and she said she'd be there, but maybe she hasn't got there. All right, we'll talk to you later. Interrupt whenever you want to say hello. We're going to take a fit. We'll come back. We're going to start promptly at 8:30 for a continued discussion.